What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, so continuing on with uh, God Loves Man Kills. Again, this is this is one of my favorite stories, guys. I mean, I, I love God Loves Man Kills. And a lot of you guys really seem to enjoy it, too. This old style of writing, very, very soap opera-like, character-focused. You know, he writes action, but it was focused more on the nature of the characters themselves. Now, here's the thing. In the aftermath of the, the death of Xavier, or at least the, the perceived death of Xavier, Cyclops, and Storm, um, this sends the X-Men, in a lot of ways, into disarray. Now, this is one of the important things to also bear in mind, too. When it came to how the X-Men were done, by Claremont, one of the things that he established very, very early on is that they were very much autonomous. They did not rely explicitly on Xavier to get their orders. And in fact, this is kind of what the X-Men had been training for. When Claremont wrote these stories, the idea was there will come a time eventually when Xavier is killed or Xavier is removed from the landscape and the X-Men have to be able to know how to function accordingly. Now, the other half of this is Kitty Pride. Now, Kitty Pride, as a character, we, we talked about her a little bit, you know, in the, the previous videos, but I want to focus a little bit more on her in this one. Kitty Pride, when she was brought into the X-Men, she was really designed to be like the young reader's kind of entryway into the X-Men mythos. And what I mean by that is Claremont was very, very good at writing characters in such a way to where they were relatable. And so when you looked at Wolverine, he was obviously a character who had been written in such a way that he'd been around for a long time, like for quite some time, and he'd seen and done a lot of things. And so with that having been the case, and it kind of turned into, okay, so like he's the guy we can follow to kind of get like the backstory of what's going on with regards to like what's been happening around the planet. His backstory was ambiguous as hell. But with regards to, to what was going on behind the scenes, that was kind of a, a way to feed into that. You looked at Cyclops and it was like, okay, what if we were like the leader of the team? Xavier was the teacher. Jean Grey was, uh, well, she was the cheerleader more or less under, under Stanley and Jack Kirby. And then she became the one who was sort of coming into her own under Claremont, kind of, you know, rising in and becoming something a little more prominent, sort of shooting up in the ranks. But Kitty Pride was the one who was like, if you're brand new to X-Men, then like Kitty Pride's the character you follow. Because she was brand new to the X-Men. She was just some young, wide-eyed kid who was brought onto the team and she was learning what it meant to be an X-Man as she fought alongside the X-Men. And so she was learning about her powers, but she was also learning what it meant to become a woman when she was being taught these various things from Storm and, and Stevie Ray and so on and so forth. Her character received a lot of emphasis in the fact that she was experiencing a lot of tough times at a very young age. She was going through like all the puberty stages that young kids go through. At the same time, she was falling in love. She was she had a huge thing for, for Colossus and she was kind of learning her place in the bigger picture. And so the idea of Professor X and Cyclops and Storm being killed is really kind of like a huge thing for her because really like the mentor she's been learning uh, that she's been learning from are really like perishing around her and so it's kind of a big thing because it's like yes this is the price we pay for being an x-man but it's not something that you're really prepared for even when it happens now as she's going through and kind of musing to herself when she's talking to like iliana rasputin the, the younger sister of colossus uh, she really just kind of goes off on her own does her own thinking and then comes across what's essentially like a spy camera belonging to the purifiers and again the purifiers are spying on the x-men and have been for quite some time and so at this point we should shift over to, to Wolverine and we shift over to Colossus. Now, this is one of the big things about how Wolverine was written back then. It's something that you don't really see anymore with this character. Wolverine was written as a character where, where again, you know, Chris Claremont sat down and said, this guy's been around for a long time. When Wolverine was part of, of, of Team X, when he was part of that Black Ops wet work team working for the CIA, I mean, they they took out political officials, they took out political rivals, they, they, they toppled governments, they did all kinds of things. And so Wolverine became very, 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 very good at staging crime scenes. And so when he goes over here with Colossus, Losses, and he starts sniffing around and he starts looking at what's going on right off the bat he says this is not what it looks like they weren't killed they were taken from here and one of the big questions that's, that's asked is how do you know this is like one i've staged enough crime scenes in my life to know what a fake crime scene looks at but not only that the bodies they found here are not the bodies of of storm and cyclops and and xavier because they don't smell the same the nose knows the scent is off at the same time you've got wolverine kind of looking around the area kind of putting his his black ops experience to, to use really like his longevity to use you've got nightcrawler who's analyzed everything and they come up on the idea there are guys who are sitting in this car over there and they're basically watching this they're, they're watching the crime scene they're, they're looking to see what happens and so those guys have to be in on it and that's when wolverine kind of picks up on the idea they're involved in this somehow and so you end up having nightcrawler who shows up you have wolverine who dons a costume you've got colossus who arrives and they try to run him over and one of the one of the girls is basically taking you know one of the folks is taken out the car explodes in a fiery crash and like two of the guys are rescued now this is one of the things that claremont was he was big on he never shied away from killing people he never shied away from from 
like the X-Men basically killing people. They wouldn't do it out of malice. The X-Men wouldn't just be like, you know what? I'm tired of you and then just kill him. You didn't really see it all that often. It would be one of these things where like it was just collateral damage, but it, but it really went towards focusing on the X-Men themselves because then it's like, how does a team that's basically a peacekeeping group, how do they handle like by their own action getting someone killed? It went really, really, really well in hand with everything that was going on in terms of, of focusing on like the nature of the character development. Now we're, we're in turn, a couple of these guys are rescued from this fire. You end up having Magneto who steps in, who literally like dismantles their suits and turns them into cocoons of sorts and locks them in. Now, right off the bat, the X-Men are just like bad guy and they respond by intending to take out Magneto, but Magneto responds by saying, I'm not here as an enemy. I'm here as an ally. Now, this is important because again, this goes into the nature of Magneto becoming somewhat of a good guy. Now, that's one of the cool things about this is he's, you know, the way he's drawn, the way he speaks, he's a guy that comes to this with experience. He's made to be very, very human. Not some guy who's like, I have magnetism powers. You know, that's, that's not really how he was done back then. Magneto's a guy who hates humans, but in this one, of, in one of these instances, it's, it's kind of like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. There is a group out there that is hunting down mutants mercilessly. They're killing them everywhere they find them, and they're not taking prisoners. They're, they're taking, you know, no quarters being offered here. And so it's really kind of like a war on mutant kind. Magneto becomes an ally of the X-Men. And, it, and it's kind of cool the way this whole thing plays out, because then you end up having uh, Kitty Pride who kind of stows away. You know, when, when these very, you know, back at the Xavier Institute, when these purifiers come back to pick up their camera, uh, Kitty Pride sort of stows away, but the purifiers are ready for them. And that's one of the things to bear in mind. You know, for her, she's inexperienced. If this had been like Colossus, if it had been, especially if Cyclops were here, it would have been a more diplomatic approach. I mean, diplomatic in so far, probably a more stealthy approach is a better, better word to use. It would have been like, we can't go in guns blazing. They have to be prepared for us. I mean, if they were to, if they were able to successfully capture Xavier and Cyclops and Storm, they had to have been prepared for us. And if they were prepared for us, it means they understand how our powers work and they know how we function as a team. Kitty Pride is not that well versed. She just kind of shows up. She tries to stow away and, you know, immediately she's captured by, by the purifiers. And so while they're basically leaving with Kitty Pride, you end up having the X-Men who were showing up with the other purifiers. Now, this is a really, really cool moment here because when it comes to this kind of situation, Claremont, again, focused on the darker side of the X-Men. The fact that they were willing to do things that would tote the line of what it meant to be a good guy and sometimes just walk across it entirely. When you're Wolverine and you've been in the trenches and you've done some pretty shady things, you don't really shy away from saying like, hey, we're probably going to have to kill some folks. We're going to have to get our hands dirty. He doesn't mind doing that. It's the nature of what he does. And so where these purifiers kind of refuse to talk, where they say like, we're not worried about this, Wolverine kind of pops his claws. But at the end of the day, they know it's taunting because all Wolverine can really do is like kill them. It's the nature of what he does. I mean, you know, he kind of pops his claws and he can scratch them a little bit, but with adamantium, Wolverine doesn't really have a whole lot of finesse. It's just kind of like, I'm going to slash you and I'm going to kill you. And that's really it. There, there's not a whole lot he can do here. He's not nuanced. And so instead, where Wolverine kind of tries to torture them and, and literally they, they hold their guns, Magneto's response is, we have to go to the darker side of things here. We have to do some bad things. And so let me be the bad guy who does bad things. And so what, what Magneto basically does here, he literally pulls apart the metal cocoons that he wrapped these guys in and starts putting, like literally entering them into their bodies. It's like putting bamboo reeds under their fingernails. He's torturing them. He's torturing them for information. And and where the other X-Men look on and they're just kind of like, is this really something that we should do? Wolverine's response is, absolutely. This is absolutely what we need to do. These guys cannot be reasoned with. You cannot get them to talk. Fear will not work. The only thing they will answer to is pain. Pain in the most extreme form. And it's literally just shards of metal being twisted through their physical bodies, you know, leaving them in a, in a state where they'll, they'll say anything to make the pain stop. And that's one of these crazy things. Magneto's well known to the purifiers. He's well known as a guy who will do whatever it takes in order to get the information that he wants. And in this instance, instead of like bombarding them with psychic torture, physical pain is what's the worst because psychic torture is you just kind of like screwing up, screwing up a person's mind. And in a lot of ways it can be worse, but physical pain from the master of magnetism sliding, you know, shards of metal into your body, like just in and out of your body, it's the most extreme form of pain that they could possibly imagine. And so they'll tell the truth because what this means is that if they don't, the pain will keep coming. They'll keep them here and then in turn, go and investigate their information. And if their information proves to be false, They'll come right back and the pain will be worse the second time around than it was the first because not only do they want the information, they're also pissed off this guy lied. So again, it's it's pretty dark and it's pretty twisted, but it's the nature of things. But I will say this, if you think this is dark and twisted at the moment, wait until you see what they do to Xavier in the next video. The purifier, like William Stryker, is cold-blooded. They absolutely torture Charles Xavier. It is one of the most, most crazy things that you could possibly imagine. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, I miss these old style X-Men stories <laughs> and I will catch you all later. Peace.